We've gone over the first three chapters. Um, we are now in chapter four of this uh, book. Unfortunately, we don't have so many of these new books. This is a really uh, very special new edition uh, that I'm really happy to uh, use in this course. Why I say that is because it's not yet in general print. The copy that we have here on the back, it says, Subong Zen Monastery. It was printed in Hong Kong at the Subong Zen Monastery, and it's a complimentary copy for free distribution. However, I only have a limited number of copies here uh, so far in Korea. Later, this book should be printed by the well-known Buddhist uh, publication uh, company. I, I'm almost sure it will be Shambhala, but I don't want to say yet. And they will print this, and then we we'll, should have more copies. But right now, we only have about 20 copies uh, to use inside the library. So please uh, be patient. Uh, eventually, you can all get your own copy of this book. And one of the advantages of using this book is that the English has been upgraded and revised to modern day English, not the kind of English that was done in the previous translation, which was a kind of antiquated English. The previous translation, the, there are several of them, the Evans Wentz translation, and there was a translation by a Chinese, um, Hanyun Luk, uh, Luk, Mr. Luk did a translation, but these translations all had a kind of, kind of an old, kind of antiquated English, and that English was difficult to understand. But this new translation has been updated and revised by two people who are both my uh, colleagues and my good, my good uh, friends and teachers. And one of them is Zen Master Dae Kwang, uh, who is uh, the uh, abbot of the Quantum School of Zen in America. He worked on the English translation of the English editing of this book. And the other is Zen Master Dae Kwan, who is the abbess of the Subong Zen Monastery, a nun's Zen center in Hong Kong, a big Zen center in Hong Kong. This international Zen center in Hong Kong uh, was founded by uh, the Zen Master Song Sung San, the Korean Zen Master Sung San, and also by his disciples. So uh, without further <laughs> ado, we can open this new book and we can take a look. We uh, can open to chapter 4, Samadhi and Prajna. Chapter 4, it's on page 181. And by the way, just let me remind you, if you have any questions uh, during this talk and you would like to ask me, Please feel free, just raise your hand. You can ask in English, you can ask in Korean, you can ask in some other language. I may not understand it, but you're free to ask. <laughs> now, this uh, chapter talks about two distinct things called samadhi and prajna. And the sixth patriarch, Hui Nang, he starts off by saying, Learned audience, fundamental to my teaching are samadhi and prajna. But don't be mistaken, samadhi and prajna are not two. They have the same substance. So already I talked before about there's this, in this sutra there's much emphasis on the non-duality, the not two nature of things. If you go to a big temple like Bomosa Temple in Busan, you'll see there's a big gate. What's the name of the gate? Burimun. That means not to gate. In English we say not to. Burimun. So this uh, sutra of uh, Winang many times talks about non-duality. Not to. And 
especially uh, the teaching about samadhi and prajna. We say, which comes first, samadhi or prajna? So, what is a samadhi? Samadhi is the, uh, here he says, it's the substance of prajna, while prajna is the function of samadhi. Okay, but many people think about samadhi as a very special state that we enter. Uh, Korean people say uh, jong. Samadhi is a jong. And prajna is a he. So jong he. And actually, we cannot say which comes first. Many people think you cannot have wisdom without samadhi. So some people, for example, say first you must get the strong samadhi and then you can have the wisdom. But Sixth Patriarch very clearly says here that the very moment we attain prajna there is samadhi and vice versa. If you understand this a principle, you understand equality of samadhi and prajna. Students should not think that there is a distinction between samadhi gives birth to prajna, prajna gives birth to samadhi. To hold such view would imply that there are two characteristics in the Dharma. Now, many people, when you ask them what is samadhi, they think about samadhi as somebody sitting in meditation with their eyes closed. And even somebody shouts at them, Aah! even somebody hits them with a stick. They don't move. They say that's a samadhi. They're very strong. Even this person sit in meditation, I hit them. Boom! I said to them, hey, you, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> then if they're really strong samadhi, not moving. We think this is how we talk about samadhi. But the six patriarch way of describing samadhi, a little different. He said, if you have samadhi, then you also have a wisdom. If you have wisdom, you also have samadhi. So he says these two are equal. This actually was revolutionary teaching because most people think first you have to get the very strong samadhi where you're not moving, you're like a kind of a statue or a tree or a rock. And then you can become wise, you can get enlightenment. And so many people tend to think of these is like a step. First, you sit down, you stretch your legs, you concentrate your mind, you go into samadhi. Once you go into samadhi, you clean and purify your mind. Your mind becomes pure, and then you get enlightened, and then you get the wisdom. Most people think of it like in steps, step by step by step by step. But very interesting is the Sixth Patriarch doesn't say that's the way it works. He says samadhi and wisdom, prajna, are equal. So if you say that you only have one but don't have the other, that's mistaken. That's a wrong view of things. It's like this. I give you a sh simpler example. In uh, Zen, we have a very basic koan. We say, which came first? The chicken or the egg? Now, somebody might say, you can't have an egg without a chicken. Then somebody else says, you can't have a chicken without an egg. Which comes first? Anybody have an answer? Nobody knows, right? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> so it's like this kind of uh, question that we cannot answer so easily. We cannot answer it with our usual logic, our usual way of thinking. We have to use some uh, special way of thinking. So we have to expand our consciousness to understand that. Because if somebody is a very, uh, maybe somebody's very logical and they say, well, of course the egg came first because the, the chicken was a baby chick inside the egg and 
it had to first come out of the egg before it became a chicken. But then somebody else can say, but if there's no chicken, no egg can be hatched. No egg can come out. The chicken has to lay the egg. And on and on and on. You can argue for a long time about this. But very difficult to get a final answer. Which comes first, chicken or the egg? So from the point of view of an ordinary lay person, lay, uh, the enlightenment of people is something very far away. Wisdom is something very far, very far away. So we have to clean and clean, and we have to purify our consciences. We have to become, go into a deep samadhi. This is the usual way of thinking. But this is very limited way of thinking. This is actually very limited because we, as the Sixth Patriarch says, we have, already we have uh, prajna within us. We have the seeds of wisdom within inside us. But we don't know that. We're not in touch with that. So if we look here, it says, if good words come from those whose hearts are impure, then samadhi and prajna are just empty speech. So if my heart, if my, when they say heart, my mind is not pure, my mind has many other things on it, then samadhi and prajna are just empty words. On the other hand, if we are good in mind as well in words, and our outward appearance and our inner feelings harmonize with each other, then it is a case of equilibrium of samadhi and prajna. So samadhi and prajna are in balance. This is an important point. We see this uh, many times uh, in the practical application. We see that if somebody is too much developed their samadhi but has not developed uh, their wisdom that they have a problem. If they too much develop their wisdom and don't have samadhi also can have a problem. So what does that mean? Samadhi and prajna have to be developed together. So there's a, a Korean uh, way of saying that Jonghae Sangsu. That means Jonghae Sangsu. Samadhi and prajna, jong is the samadhi, he is prajna, the two have to rise together. The two go up together. This is important. So why we say that? Let's say somebody only reads many books and they don't practice meditation. They think they understand, but when it actually comes to application, it's difficult to do. It's difficult to apply what they learn to their everyday life. It's still up here. It's still in the head or in the book. <laughs> so this means to practically apply that, we have to do some meditation. Meditation is what leads to samadhi. Jong is a meditation or samadhi can be used either way. So if we only read and understand Buddhism, it's not complete. It means we have developed our cognition. Do you understand that word, cognition? Cognition, maybe Korean word is jishik. Knowledge or uh, cognition. But if we uh, do rely on that, it cannot help us so much. This is not going to help us in our everyday life, in the marketplace. <coughs> it's not going to help us as much as if we have both the cognition <coughs> and the meditation. When the two come together, we say this is complete balance, equilibrium. So many monks, in order to make sure that their practice was complete, would sometimes go to sit in the busy marketplace. They would sit meditation, let's say go to Namdaemun Market, and you know, all of you have been to Namdaemun Market, and they're always saying like, Paji, Paji, Ochonwan, Paji, Paji, Ochonwan, you know, 
get your pants for oath of 5,000 won, you know, and many things like that. And if you're a really strong meditator, you can sit in the middle of the market or you can walk through the market with a completely clear and bright, not moving mind. But if you are not so strong meditator, then you go there and you start to wonder, Shall I, do I need this? Do I want to buy that? And your minds are going all over. There are so many monks in the past would go to sit in a busy marketplace or would sit under a bridge where many people passed over in order to test their meditation. We say this is a testing samadhi. This is only the test of samadhi. How strong the meditation is, how strong samadhi is. But this is not the test of a wisdom. Wisdom is a different thing. Wisdom means we know what is going to be helpful, what will help the people around us, what is not important. Wisdom means we, moment to moment, we know how to function. We know how to do our function. So it's not enough just to sit in the marketplace like a tree or a stone. But we, if we really have wisdom, we may want to interact, have some function in the marketplace. That's why before, maybe I already told you, or I'm not sure if I told you the story, but Sosan Zen Master, he went to the marketplace, and he sat down, and in front of him were many grass shoes, and every day he would bring grass shoes and sell them in the marketplace. And someday he would sell all the shoes, and he would come back to the temple, he would have empty bag. He had sold maybe 20 or 30 shoes that day. Those shoes, by the way, were called the Egyptian. They were made of grass. He would sell 20 or 30 shoes, and then the monk at the temple said to him, Oh, Zen Master Sosan, how was your business today? And he said, not so good. Not so good business. Then the monk was surprised because his bag was empty. He sold all the shoes. He got some money. He had some good business, looks like. But he said, not so good. Then the next day, he went to the market a place, and he sat. And all day, he didn't even sell one shoe. Not even one shoe. But he's sitting there very happy, happily. And when he came home that evening with all the shoes, he came back. Again, the abbot of the temple asked him, Zen Master, how was your business today? He said, very good, very good business, wonderful business. So he wasn't really concerned about the sales. He wasn't concerned about how much the money. What he was concerned was just his presence, being there. That's all. Being in the market was enough for him. We say this is a, uh, the samadhi and also the wisdom, the prajna and samadhi come together. Sometimes many sell, sometimes do not sell. This is not as important as being there, completely present in the marketplace. This was a Sosan uh, Zen master. And so we look on this uh, samadhi and prajna chapter. It says, argument is unnecessary for a practicing person. People who like to argue are deluded. Argument implies a desire to win, strengthens egoism, and attaches to the idea of a self, an ego, a personality, a being, and a life. <laughs> well, that's difficult for us to accept, actually, especially people like myself who come from a country where we like to do debate things and argue about things. I know many Asian people don't like to argue, especially with their teacher. They like to just say yes. Yes, and writing, 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 writing. Asian students are like that. What a teacher says, I write down. And they don't like to argue. But Western people like to argue. And maybe arguing is sometimes, is sometimes not really argue, but debating and questioning things is sometimes very helpful. It sometimes brings us to a new understanding. So we cannot say there's only one way. We cannot say that uh, we should uh, not question 
we should not argue, we should not do anything. But what the uh, sixth patriarch in this sutra, what he emphasizes is arguing over concepts. We should not argue over concepts like samadhi, like prajna. These things we should not, we cannot understand them by debating them. This is an interesting point in Buddhism because many people approach Buddhism uh, as if it was to be debated. But our uh, teachers, especially the masters of old, they said that we should not argue because it implies that we want to win something. We want to gain and strengthen our ego. And it attaches to the idea of a self, an ego, a personality, a being, and a life. Well, let's look at this more closely. How are samadhi and prajna the same? So, they are similar to a lamp and its light. If you use a lamp, then there is a light, but without it, it is dark. The lamp is the substance of the light, and the light is the function of the lamp. In nature, they are two things, but in substance, they are one and the same. It is the same with samadhi and prajna. When you turn off the light, you cannot see the lamp. You cannot see anything in the room. So the issue of the lamp and the light being separate disappears. They are connected completely. So, prajna is something that we cannot separate from samadhi. We cannot say we can have a wisdom without some clear concentration. Without some clear meditation, we cannot say that we can have wisdom. Many people think wisdom is just something you get when you're old. When you get older, you get wise. Is that true? But we see many times, we see people who are very old who are not so wise. We see them very attached to their material things. Maybe uh, sometimes we have this experience. We see somebody who is getting quite old, and they're looking around at all the things that they own, and they're saying, when I die, who will get my house? Who will get my car? Who will get my rings? One woman that uh, I heard about, she was dying in the nursing home. And even she knew she was dying, she sat. And as she was dying, rather than meditating on the, me the meaning of her life or where she would go, when after she died, she only sat there looking at her rings. Oh, should I give the ring to this child or this grandchild? What should I do with my jewelry? And she was quite upset, thinking about her jewelry and her rings, and for days was lamenting and despairing over who should get my ring, who should get my things when I die. <coughs> this is not what we call the uh, wisdom, actually. Wisdom is not uh, invested in material things, not invested even in my life. Wisdom is only this moment, this moment What's happening? This moment, what's the most important thing? Where am I going this moment? Not something that I have right now, not what I'm carrying. So, of course, we all have to make difficult decisions. Sometime we have to uh, maybe write our will or something like that or decide things like that. But despairing and uh, becoming... Uh, argumentative over these things cannot help us. This is, means we don't have a wisdom. So when we practice meditation, we go into a state where we are not so much uh, concerned with where we came from, and we're not really uh, sure about where we will go, but we understand where we are right now. We perceive that completely. And by perceiving that completely, we can more understand what our true nature is, who we truly are. And so we say that the wisdom and the meditation or samadhi are not separate. These are the same thing. 
So if we really want to have a true wisdom, we should practice meditation. We should have some experience of samadhi. This opens the way for us to have some wisdom. And the uh, sixth patriarch he talked about, page 182, he talked about practicing straightforwardness and not attaching to anything. He said, we should practice being straightforward, straightforwardness and not attached to anything. Deluded people are attached to the form of dharma. They define absorption in action as sitting motionless, without thought arising in your mind. If you understand in this way, you are just like an inanimate, inanimate object. This will obstruct your practicing path. The path should be like free-flowing water, not stagnant. If your mind is attached to dharma, that's a form of self-restraint. If you sit without moving, you are like Shariputra, sitting in the forest being admonished by Virmalakirti. Well, this is a little difficult, but the point is that we should not attach to the not moving state. We should not attach to the inanimate things either. Of course, if we are always moving around, it's not possible to practice meditation. But it, when we do meditation, if we uh, are instructed <clears throat> not to move and stay there continuously without moving, sometimes we have a problem. We deluded people become attached to this and they become crazy because it's not our nature to always be sitting. It's not our nature to always be standing either. It's not our nature to always be non-moving. We need to move around. We need to do different things. We need to have various activity. So if we force ourselves into one posture, that's also not good. What's very important is that we can find out what is the essence, what is the nature of our mind, and find out how to purify that. It's not so uh, difficult. But in order to do that, we need to uh, let go of our strong ideas, let go of our ideas and our condition. And we need to get some wisdom. So he goes on to say, some teachers of meditation instruct their students to observe their mind. Is it pure or not? They also teach them to sit without moving or to stand continuously. Deluded people attach to this style and become crazy. Such cases are not rare, and it is a great mistake to teach others to practice like this. So what's most important in these words is, he says, deluded people attach to this style. That's important, because if we don't sit, and we don't sit still without moving, it's very difficult to experience meditation. If you only are always walking or running around or doing something or, or always moving, it's very difficult to experience meditation. We have to sometimes sit. And of course, some people really want to sit for hours, like a yogi, not moving. But if we become attached to sitting, this is also a sickness. If we are attached to sitting, then we become, we get crazy. And it's possible to get crazy in the uh, sense that we become a fanatic about some part of the meditation, one form of the meditation. So the sixth patriarch was a very, the most, the core of his teaching came from the Diamond Sutra. Those of you who have read the Diamond Sutra know the Diamond Sutra says, don't attach to anything that arises in your mind. Don't attach to the mind itself. You must not even attach to the mind. You must not be attached to anything that arises in the mind. You should not be attached to the concept of being a generous person, of being a bodhisattva, of being a helper, of being a wonderful, enlightened being. None of those things should move you. These are all attachments. If we cut off all these attachments, then we can slowly, we can understand 
what we truly are, our true self. So this uh, uh, teaching is of, actually is of a wisdom teaching from the Diamond Sutra. And how we apply this teaching is very important. So even though you may understand it, uh, you may understand it intellectually, how you apply it is another matter. We need to not be attached to the Dharma itself. So this is the most, one of the most fundamental teachings that the Buddha gave. He said, my teaching is like a raft. You approached, you came to a big wide river, like the Han River. And you want to cross the Han River, but there, let's say there are no bridges. Maybe uh, now there are how many bridges across the Han River? Maybe 20 bridges? 22. Wow, so many bridges, yeah. Nobody takes a boat across the Han River anymore. <laughs> 24 bridges, wow. But many years ago, I heard there were no bridges. Maybe there were only one bridge left after the uh, Korean War, right? Only one bridge. One. Yeah, one bridge, like Hangang Daegyo or something like that. Right, so let's say you wanted to cross the Han River. Now, if you are not near that bridge, maybe you find a small boat and you row yourself across the Han River. Maybe over there near the, you know, the Sheraton Hotel, over there the river is not so wide, so you can you know, row yourself across you know, Walker Hill over there, this area. Or, and you, you know, row yourself across the river. But when you get to the other side, let's say you borrowed the boat from somebody. Now, when you get to the other side, what are you going to do with the boat? Now, somebody might say, this boat really served me well, and it helped me across this Han River, and I don't know, I may need to use it again soon. So somebody takes this boat, they put it above their head, it's very heavy, they carry it around with them. Oh, now I have this boat. Who knows, I may need to cross another river soon in the future. But meanwhile, they're carrying this heavy boat around with them. So many people approach Buddhism like that. They learn something about one dharma, and then they carry this dharma around with them. And it becomes attachment. And the true way of the bodhisattva is once you've crossed the river, you leave the boat at the edge for the next person to come along. Or even better, you give the boat to somebody else who really needs it. So this is also one of the fundamental teachings. The Buddha said, my teaching is like a raft. Once you cross the river, you don't carry it around with you. You don't attach to it. So you don't attach even to the form of the Dharma. So just as we were reading, he said, if your mind is attached to Dharma, that's a form of self-restraint. Of course, it's better that your mind is attached to Dharma than your mind is attached to, let's say, uh, comic books, or let's say your mind is attached to, uh, you know, whatever, TV. Or <laughs> it's better that you're attached to Dharma than attached to, to TV. But better than all these things is no attachment. So no attachment can lead us to the greatest kind of wisdom the greatest kind of experience. But we have to be willing to, to try that. Most of us don't want to try. Most of us, we have our strong attack. We're carrying around our boat, our kind of little boat that we carry. And so part of this uh, teaching that the Six Patriarch go gave was, is we, don't be attached. Don't carry around your own little Dharma boat. OK? Any questions? about that? <laughs>